Hey, what's up you lot? Path here. I wanted to wish you a very, very belated Happy New Year, Happy New Decade. I hope you guys have been doing well and have had a restful holiday season if you've been taking some time off. And if you haven't, I hope it's been a productive December slash early January for you guys. In this video, I want to talk about quantum tunneling or tunneling if you're from the US, a really interesting phenomenon that is actually forbidden in classical physics. Classical physics, of course, being the physics that came before relativity and quantum mechanics, which, like I said, did not allow for this phenomenon to actually be possible. Before we get into it, I just quickly wanted to mention that I recently featured in a video on Higgsino Physics's channel. I spoke about using a scanning tunneling microscope to take images of graphite on the atomic level, and a scanning tunneling microscope actually relies on quantum tunneling to work. So if you haven't seen that video already, go check it out if you've got a minute, I highly recommend it. There were also lots of other physics YouTubers in there, so yeah, definitely go check it out. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into it. Let's talk about quantum tunneling. To understand what this phenomenon actually is, we need to start by laying down some groundwork. We are going to be studying the behavior of an electron as it encounters something known as a potential barrier. Firstly, let's start by making things simple for ourselves. Let's say that this electron is restricted so that it can only move along a straight line. It can only move to the right or to the left. This way, we only have to consider the electron's motion in one dimension. Let's call this the x direction. Moving to the right is positive and moving to the left is negative. Now, under just these limitations, technically our electron is a free electron. It can move anywhere to the right and anywhere to the left. There's no other external forces acting on the electron, restricting or making it move in a particular direction. But now, let's change that. Let's introduce something else to the system that will affect the motion of the electron. Let's introduce something known as a potential barrier. We can do this by, for example, introducing another electron to our system. Now, this second electron is not actually mobile. It can't freely move anywhere at once in a single direction like our first electron can. The only reason that it's there is to introduce a potential barrier, and we'll see what this means in a second. Anyway, so we've now placed a second electron in this position here. How does that electron being there affect the motion of our first electron? Because electrons are negatively charged particles. Therefore, they will repel each other. So let's say that our first electron initially starts out here on the line that it can move along and we give it a push toward the right. So we push it toward the second electron. Eventually it gets close enough to the second electron that it experiences a sizable repulsive force. Remember that electrons are both negatively charged and like charges repel each other. Due to the restrictions that we have put on the motions of these electrons, the only thing that will happen is that there'll be a force exerted on our first electron toward the left. The point here is that when we push our first electron toward the second electron, if we don't give it enough kinetic energy, that electron is going to bounce back at us. This is simply due to the repulsive force exerted between these two electrons, considering they're both negatively charged particles. We would have to give our first electron a lot more kinetic energy if we actually want it to pass the position of the second electron. So let's do just that. Let's give our first electron a much bigger push. We provide it a lot more kinetic energy. This time, it still experiences that repulsive force from the second electron. But because we gave it so much kinetic energy at the beginning, it's got enough to overcome this repulsive force and get to the other side of the electron. We can represent this entire situation with a sort of glorified graph. On this graph, we're representing the line along which the first electron moves on the horizontal axis, we've already called it the x-axis, and on the vertical axis, we're representing energy. Specifically, the first energy that we can represent is the potential energy barrier due to the repulsion of the two electrons. Let's label this potential energy curve V. Now, on this graph, we can also represent the energy that we were giving to the first electron in order to try and overcome this potential barrier. Basically, the idea is that if we don't give the first electron enough of a push toward the right, then it can't get over this potential barrier created by our second electron. And in real life terms, what that means is that it can't get to a position to the right of this second electron. Basically, this gives us a way to visualize what's going on very nicely. If we provide the first electron with enough energy, then it can get over the potential barrier, it can make it to the other side of the electron. But if we don't give it enough energy, if the energy we provide to the first electron is less than the peak energy of the potential barrier, then the electron cannot get to the other side of the potential barrier. Now, I am gonna pause here for a moment and say that the terminology I've used up until this point is kind of wishy-washy, it's not very thorough. But what I want you to take away from this is an understanding, a visualization of how an electron would behave if it were restricted to move along a straight line, 
and we placed another second electron into the situation, and this second electron was creating a potential barrier for the first one. Basically, we need to provide the first electron with enough of a kick to get over this potential barrier. Now, the whole point on my part of actually bringing this second electron into the picture was to show you how a potential barrier may be created. In this example, we utilize the mutual repulsion of like charged particles. But to make things even simpler and to start thinking about quantum tunneling, let's abstract things a little bit more. Let's now stop worrying about how we would create a potential barrier. And let's also imagine that we can create a potential barrier that looks exactly like this. Once again, we're calling this potential V and it's gonna behave in exactly the same way as the potential barrier created by the electron. Specifically in this case, the potential at any X position less than let's say X is equal to zero is zero. But then between X is equal to zero and let's say X is equal to A, A is some value, we don't care what this value is, the potential suddenly increases to a value U. Again, we don't care what U is, we just know that it's a value and it's a constant value. And then to the right of X is equal to A, so for any X value larger than A, the potential becomes zero once again. In other words, our potential barrier looks like a step, basically. Now, the reason that we're considering this particular potential barrier or this particular shaped potential barrier is because it makes the maths easier and it makes it easier to visualize what's going on as well. Before, we had a potential barrier that changed smoothly as we move from left to right. However, in this case, we can divide the line along which our electron moves into three chunks. The first chunk is for every X coordinate less than zero. So basically everything to the left of X is equal to zero. The second Second chunk is between x is equal to 0 and x is equal to a, and the third chunk is to the right of x is equal to a. Dividing our line into three chunks is going to make all of the maths easier, although like I said we're not going to be doing any maths in this video, and that's why we've chosen this potential barrier and decided not to worry how we would go about producing this potential barrier in real life. It's just a thought experiment. So as we've already briefly mentioned, in this particular case, in classical physics, what happens as the electron moves from left to right is that if it doesn't have enough energy, it can't get over the potential barrier. So if the electron has less energy than the top of the potential barrier, it bounces back. It basically moves toward x is equal to zero and then reflects and moves back towards the left. However, if we provide enough energy to the electron beforehand, then it can get over the barrier to the other side. Pretty simple stuff, right? Like quite simple. But if only life were that simple. Why is life not that simple? Because quantum mechanics. What we've done so far is fairly reasonable if we're in the regime of classical physics. But you know that's not how we do things on this channel. So let's bring in the big boy that is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics tells us firstly that knowing the position and velocity of this electron is a lot more complicated than classical physics lets on. Check out my video on Heisenberg's uncertainty principle which I made a long time ago and will probably need to update at some point but check it out anyway if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about here. But that's not the important bit. The important bit here is that our understanding or rather our knowledge of an electron's position, velocity, etc is linked to a wave function. Specifically, this wave function is directly related to the probability distribution of our electron because quantum mechanics tells us the probability with which we will find our electron in a certain position. In other words, in classical physics, we knew that initially this electron was here and then it was here and then it was here and so on and so forth. However, this is not the case in quantum mechanics. The wave function only tells us that, say for this particular point in time, we're most likely to find the electron here, here, and here, and very unlikely to find it here, here, and here. For the purposes of this video, we just need to know that if we take our wave function and square it, technically take its square modulus, then we will find the probability distribution of this electron. What this means is that we can draw a dotted line along the middle of this sinusoid. And the points at which the wave function is furthest away from this dotted line, those are the positions at which we have the highest probability of finding our electron. I won't go into too much detail here about the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. I've talked about that in other videos because we need to really carry on and talk about quantum tunneling. So a question. How do we know what the wave function of this electron looks like in any particular region? Well, the answer to that is that we solve what's known as the Schrodinger equation. Now, I've made a video about the Schrodinger equation before, so check it out if you haven't already. I'm plugging a lot of my videos in this one, so, you know, I'm gonna be shameless about it, sorry about that. But the Schrodinger equation is basically the big equation in quantum mechanics. It's certainly the most famous one that people have mostly heard of. And for a one-dimensional system just like this, the Schrodinger equation governs what a wave function looks like for a particle which has a mass m for various different positions x, where the potential is v. 
The energy of the electron, by the way, is E, and we also see the reduced Planck constant sprinkled into our Schrodinger equation as well. We don't need to understand the details of this equation. All we need to know is that we can solve this equation in three different regions. Those three different regions are the regions where the values of V are different. And we can choose to solve with different energies of the electron. The most important scenarios in our case being the ones where Firstly, the electron has slightly less energy than the top of the potential barrier, and secondly, the electron has more energy than the top of the potential barrier. The scenario where the electron has more energy than the top of the potential barrier is boring. It just basically tells us that the electron can get from one side to the other. We don't really learn a huge amount because we sort of expected that from classical physics. There are some intricate details, but we won't go into that here. The really interesting case is when we consider the electron having less energy than the top of the potential barrier. In classical physics, we would have expected the probability of us finding our electron on the other side of the potential barrier to be zero, because the electron has less energy than the top of the potential barrier, so how does it get there? Well, with quantum mechanics, we're considering the wave function of our electron. And the wave function, surprise, surprise, behaves like a wave. There is indeed a non-zero solution to the Schrodinger equation on the other side of the barrier. There is a non-zero probability that our electron will be found on the other side of the barrier. This is quantum tunneling. The electron does have a chance of getting to the other side of the barrier, even though classically it didn't have enough energy. And specifically within the potential barrier, our wave function looks like this. It looks like an exponential decay curve. And that's exactly what it is. The probability of us finding our electron as we move further and further to the right is decaying exponentially, which means that the wider the barrier, the less chance we have of finding our electron on the other side. But if we've got a really narrow barrier, then the electron has a decent chance of being found on the other side of the barrier. By the way, just as an aside, when a wave decays exponentially, this is known as an evanescent wave. Wake me up. Wake me up inside. Can't wait. Bring me to life. No, not that kind of evanescence. I'm never going to sing on camera ever again, by the way. Sorry about that. So this is the mind-blowing slash interesting discovery of today. Electrons can tunnel across potential barriers even though the energy of that electron initially was not higher than the top of that potential barrier. This is quantum tunneling and it's really useful in explaining phenomena such as radioactivity. It's also what we use to build machines such as scanning tunneling microscopes which allow us to look at things on a much smaller scale than a usual optical microscope. It's amazing and it's mind-blowing and there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that it really does happen. And now we, watching this video slash making it, vaguely know why. As another quick aside, by the way, evanescent waves are a very classical phenomenon. They're not new to quantum mechanics. They've been known about for a long time. We've known, for example, that electromagnetic waves such as light can show evanescent behavior in certain circumstances. But the thing that makes our study here quantum rather than classical is the fact that electrons were always thought to be particles, not waves. We had no idea that they could display wave-like behavior via their wave functions and get to positions or places where we initially thought they had no chance of getting to. And with all of that being said, I'm going to end this video here. Thank you so much for watching my first video of 2020, first video of the new decade, and hopefully loads more to come. As always, if I've made a mistake, let me know in the comments down below. I'll try and correct it as quickly as possible. And if I haven't explained anything clearly enough, then let me know as well. I'll try and clarify. Leave me a comment down below letting me know what physics topic you'd like me to talk about, anything interesting that you'd like me to cover, and I'll try my best to get to it. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye.